Hi everyone, welcome to my channel uh, where I talk about stuff from time to time. Um, today is going to be a, like a little bit different video. Uh, I normally do uh, essays where I where I have some B uh, roll footage and uh, and I I have a, a voiceover and I talk about the book that I like or something. But uh, I want to talk about the Wheel of Time adaptation. And what I'm going to do, I spend a few days writing a, a script of, of ideas uh, that I want to talk about. So I decided to to just go through and read that. Uh, it's here right in front of me, so I'll be reading that and uh, and trying to uh, to talk through all my my thoughts and ideas and feelings about this this adaptation and then and just uh, just for just to start it as a preamble um, what I really want to to give with this discussion it's a discussion is a debate uh, it's my opinion uh, as many other people have their own opinions I wanted people to want more and to uh, demand more from, from Amazon. That's the preamble. Let's go to the script. War of Altai, Robert Jordan's first novel, was written in 13 days. It was never published until last year when Tor Books alongside Jordan's wife Harriet worked to bring his first full novel to the public. The War of Altai was written in 13 days, but it took decades to be completed. I'm bringing this up at this moment as a foreshadow to the discussion further on. What the Wheel of Time is, more than anything else, is Jordan's magnum opus. More so in the sense that it was Robert Jordan's writing in the peak of his performance both creatively and functionally. To put almost a book a year, books as long as a volume of The Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, and to do that in a way that there's an overarching story connecting all the books, characters communicate, uh, development, and plot, for the most part, remains interesting and compelling, or at least followable. He gathered all his skills and methods from writing his earlier novels and a number of the Conan series books beside his original writing, and he infused that with a desire to follow in Tolkien's uh, classic fantasy uh, writings, and at the same time trying to bring something new to the table. It is also hugely influenced by his own life and experience. I am no expert on either The Wheel of Time nor Robert Jordan as a person, but based on his interviews and talks, the people of the Two Rivers are heavily inspired by his own upbringing in South Carolina, in a countryside, homogenous, borderline, xenophobic uh, society. And that is noticed with the characters born and raised in the Two Rivers. Rand and the boys are naive, gullible from time to time. Naive is aggressive and constantly on the defensive towards Moraine, Egwene is in a constant state of awe of the world she's being pulled into. But they have to fight against their instincts to continue in this journey because there is much larger world outside of their village that is in peril and by chance, or not so much chance as we learned throughout the series, those five young people from a distant secluded hamlet should take the burden of saving this world. I'm not going to compare that to Bilbo Baggins and his The State for Adventure but the trope of the small village hero is a trope for a reason, because it is compelling. But what is the Wheel of Time, the fantasy series? In a world where magic is channeled by trained and powerful people, one man decided to destroy all that is evil against the best judgment of his peers. In doing so, he inadvertently touched the tainted half of the power the one power is now completely and decisively divided. On one side, the pure 
and useful side R, the female half, and on the other side, side D, the tainted, murky male side of the one power. This man, Louis Sturius Telmo, the dragon, broke the word and with that turned the wheel of time. As we also learn further on, the word of the wheel of time is also our own word, only a few turns of the wheel in the future. That on itself is one of the most interesting ideas of the whole series, a cycle of birth, growth and destruction that separates full its existences. Also foreshadowed to for the final part of this essay. The One Power, for me at least, is the most simple and yet complicated character of the Wheel of Time series. Looking very functionally at it, it is simply the magic system, a semi-hard magic system with rules and regulations, limits very well designed, in both advantages and drawbacks in using it or channeling. As a magic system, it is easy to understand. At one point, the male half of the One Power, the source of all magic, has been tainted and somehow cursed. Sidin, this male half, and Sidar, the female, more active half, and therefore are therefore very well delimited. The Aes Sedai are trained practitioners of the channeling of the One Power. A woman that can touch the source can also channel without proper training and support from more skilled and experienced Aes Sedai, that power, without the training, without the support, can ultimately kill the user uh, and the ones around her. That works differently for Sidin. Men that can touch the source have to be stopped, not because they won't be able to control it, even though they first centrally will not, but because the male side of the source is tainted and because of that, anyone who touches this will eventually be fully corrupted, go insane, die, and perhaps destroy the whole world. Only the dragon, or the dragon reborn, in the case of the time being told in the main series of books, can channel, control, and use Saidi. As a narrative tool, the One Power is a strong plot deliverance. It is in the center of the conflict, it is both the MacGuffin in parts, or the reason for a contrivance. In comparison, the One Power is more closely related to Eru Iluvatar himself in the, in the uh, Lord of the Rings series than with the One Ring. It is part and parcel of the story, and it is the thread and needle of the plot. And Saidin and Saidar, as divisions, separate divisions, half of that One Power, are in themselves also plot movers. Sidar is controlled, conditioned, and practiced, whilst Sidin is aggressive, raw, and should be always avoided. That creates another characteristic of the series, the rift between women and men that can channel. Women are the ones who know best how to maneuver within the source and know how to operate this power, and men, men need to be overlooked and sometimes babysit not because men are inferior or for simple gender swap, but because, as part of the roots of the story and the lore, how it was written, something happened where half of the source of the power in the world has been polluted by the actions of one of its protectioners, therefore making the whole of Sidene dirty and corrupted. As a plot mover that has been used before, Excalibur will only be given to the real future King of England. The rings given to the race of man by Sauron were corrupted itself, themselves. The Jedi and the Sith use and are empowered by the Force in very different ways. What all of those examples have in common is that those are the main cogs in the mechanism that turns the plot. And we have seen how adaptations adapt those ideas. It has been told, and it is known by those who need to know, that a boy will be born, a reincarnation or a recycled version of Louis Theron, in very specific circumstances. And that boy, who will be able to channel Sidene, will be the Dragon Reborn, who will break or save the world, turning the wheel, and recreating the world through his desires or views. 
The legend very specifically says that the boy will follow Louis Theron, the original dragon, and his journey to reset the world. It is a chosen one style story, and it is both a tale of destiny and circumstance. Like Anakin Skywalker, the Dragon Reborn will come as a wielder of the One Power slash the Force and will bring balance to the world or destroy it, depending on who shall get a hold of him first. Just like the One Power, the idea of the Dragon Reborn as a wielder of Saidi, the one who will bring the world to a turn, in is paramount to the Wheel of Time, to the Wheel of Time series as a whole and a keystone for all the bloodlines happening throughout the books. Moraine's mission is to find the dragon, whom she believes is one of the three boys from, from the two rivers. During the journey, she and Lan ended up getting together with two other Emil Fielders in Nynaeve and uh, Egwene. When they're leaving Emil Field, Moraine is not happy that the two girls tagged along, but she says that regardless of her own understanding of the mission, the we weaves as the we wills, and that all five of them are part of the thread, each one with their own path to follow and road to achieve. Nynaeve and Egwene are taken in that adventure, not knowing what or why they were woven in this thread. Along the way, they will find out that their role and their place in the turn of the wheel is much bigger than anyone anticipated. The women of the White Tower believe that these two, along with the lane further on, are the most powerful Aes Sedai in the world. That is pretty much believed to be because of the blood of the Manetheran, which flows in all of the five Amonfielders veins. Their stories unfold throughout the troubles of becoming Aes Sedai learning to trust others, overcoming their fears of others, and finally, mastering channeling the One Power. I won't go too much into it, first because it's not the place, and second because, as I said, I am no expert in on the Wheel of Time. But one of the most important and, and pivotal things that are mentioned in the book is that anyone who channels, and even more those who are very powerful, need to properly train and understand how to touch and move within the source. It does not matter that you have the old blood running through your body or that you are the chosen one. You have to have the training required to hold and contain such power. As an, as an analogy, you can have amazing reflexes, but if you want to become a racing car driver, you have to learn how to hone those skills inside the machine of the car. And that's where a number of adaptations fail to transpose the story from book to screen. By disregarding the training, the struggles, the incompetence and ignorance of an apprentice, the final result is almost always diminished. An adaptation of an intellectual property from one media to another is most definitely not an easy or straightforward task. A story told in a thousand page book has much more room to grow and to expand. The characters have more space and time to develop. An exposition, it's not so bad, it's used well and sparsely. Turning that into a movie a TV series or a video game, or even a music album, is a mammoth task. First of all, to turn a book into a movie slash TV show, one needs to find a thread, a single well-defined story thread, and pick that to be the main plot mover of the movie slash show. A film in average will give the audience two and a half hours to develop a character, a TV show a little bit more, uh, and to tell a concise and yet engaging story uh, give a glimpse of the side stories as they go by, and if they're necessary for the main story thread, and will eventually set the scene for a sequel slashing following season. The Lord of the Rings, arguably the best book to movie adaptation ever made, still receives backlash for not adding elements and storylines that book readers loved in the books. One example is Tom Bombadil. Tom is a major element in the books, and has a major role to play in the whole 
big arch of the story of Middle Earth. But if put into the movies, it will derail the story Peter Jackson was trying to tell. Jackson chose to focus the story on a few storylines. Frodo and the Ring, Aragorn and the Kingdom of Gondor, and Gandalf and Saruman's relationship. Three storylines, three immense and heavy plots to be moving around, with some tens of other smaller arches walking next to them, such as Sam and Gollum, Merry Pippin and Treebeard, Boromir, Faramir and Denethor, Arwen and Elrond, the list goes on. So, by adding Tom's story in the middle of a building up of the first act of the first film of the trilogy, would only take from the whole piece collectively, instead of adding anything. It was a hard choice, I believe. It is a choice that still causes conflict, but in the end, it was a choice for the benefit of the final product. Tom Bombadil not being the Lord of the Rings is sad, but not controversial or disrespectful. On the contrary, Peter Jackson wanted to be able to create the most faithful recreation of Tolkien's Middle Earth with the space offered in film. That being said, even though The Lord of the Rings opened the door for many other fantasy and sci-fi books to be adapted to the big screen or the TV, it also became the exception and not the rule. I will not give examples of other shows or movies that disrespective or didn't uh, follow the source material, but I do not know of any other major book series adaptation that had not created a rift in its fan base or turned the whole fan base entirely against the adaptation. With that said, Game of Thrones, I said I wasn't going to name names, but it's the most visible example, it was based on George R. R. Martin's best-selling book series, A Song of Ice and Fire. The showrunners and Martin had a close relationship from the start and worked together to bring the series from page to screen. During the first few seasons, in my opinion, season 5 is the beginning of the downfall. The series managed to adapt quite faithfully the story of the Seven Kingdoms, the Iron Throne, and the threat from beyond the wall. After Martin and the showrunners had a split on their work relationship, even though uh, George R. R. Martin still had an executive producer role, at least on paper, the series went into an ego trip, or ego cult, uh, that turned into a turn a book series adaptation into a pet project for the two showrunners. A pet project that they lost interest in after being given, and then later taken away, a Star Wars project, and left it to shrivel and die in the most pathetic way. When a showrunner's main interest in a whole season of a show is to put a zombie snow bear in a random scene you know they have no interest in plot or lore or the source material as, as a whole. Ultimately, their disregard to fans, to the source material and to the author himself transform what could have been the biggest fantasy series ever put into screen into a poison chalice that just a few years after the finale are aired, no one dares nor wants to talk about it. It is, for all intents and purpose, that. Amazon has a style of making things. Lean, cost-effective, trendy, fast. That can translate well into delivery of goods, but it's a very dangerous structure to develop any creative project. The Wheel of Time production, unfortunately, has much more in common with the second half of Game of Thrones than with The Lord of the Rings. An adaptation more than anything and first of all is a project of love and care love of an already existing product or intellectual property and care with the people involving in creating that IP and people engaged with the original media of its material it is not a place for ego and for individual agendas 
When a creative endeavor is, by its own origins, put in the frame of cost cutting, fast pacing, schedule meeting, the result will never favor the process of creation, but will always push for the final product, whatever that may be. Streaming platforms such as Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, and of course Amazon have a logic that more is more. They don't need to have a good product. They need to have more products than the other platform. And what is the easiest way to bring people to your platform? To have the most IPs possible under your umbrella. Amazon saw the opportunity to grab not one, but two of the most known and beloved fantasy IPs of all time in The Wheel of Time and The Lord of the Rings. But in their minds, they're not looking at the potential to tell the story of a large, engaging, beloved series. They see a way to create their own Game of Thrones phenomenon, even though they deny that. The source material is a blueprint of what the movie or series should be. The first half of Game of Thrones and the Lord of the Rings trilogy were two of the most successful and most adored adaptations of fantasy book series. After the fallout of George R. R. Martin's relationship with the Game of Thrones showrunners, the series dropped in quality, mostly because the show ran out of source material and had to rely on people who, in reality, never cared or loved fantasy. Lord of the Rings is the exception as the care put into creating those films produced a love letter to Tolkien, to literature, to cinema, and to fans of the series. Now, there are different ways to adapt the story to a different media. One can go the Witcher way and go from book to video game, where a story is in the background, but you, the player, is acting in. That works because the Witcher book series is written and as short stories put together as an anthology, which in itself offers freedom for the author himself to create more stories, not necessarily follow, following a chronological uh, rhyme. The second way is a direct adaptation, sort of like what Lord of the Rings did. Many tried and failed to do so as well mostly for the same reasons that the Wheel of Time is failing. Third is a loose adaptation, with examples such as The Shining, or The, the Hunting of Hugh House, or Arrival. They follow an idea brought by the book and go with it, but through a different reasoning. And then there is direct recreation or reimagination which it's something that the, the Marvel Cinematic universes, uh, Universe falls under. They build new stories using already existing characters and even already existing storylines. But the idea is that the MCU is a different universe from the already multiple universes in the comics. At this point, the showrunner or filmmaker needs to pick which one of those paths he or she will want to follow. But as soon as that is chosen, it is dangerous to try and jump from one to another. From the marketing material, interviews, talks, and the whole expectation with the hype around the show, the Wheel of Time looked like it was going to go the direct adaptation route. Which, especially in a hard-set fantasy series as the Wheel of Time, as Game of Thrones, or Lord of the Rings, is the best and, arguably, the most challenging option. The reason being is you have a piece of creative work that you are adapting and want to pay homage to, but you also need to show creativity in how you transpose certain elements from page to screen. However, as the episodes went by and the plotline started to be opened and exposed, we realized that this endeavor was not to be a love letter to a beloved creative creation, but a vehicle for profit through name recognition and a place to regurgitate trends. I'm not condemning whoever actually enjoyed the series, but more than anything, I feel that rather than crash and burn a beloved series, 
Amazon would instead search for something original to be their bootleg fantasy series with edgy, disconnected scenes. At this point, I want to point out a few specific things that make this such um, odd putting together series for both the actor, for both the author and the fans. Amazon is arguably the largest media conglomerate in the world, meaning that theoretically it has the money to hire the best creatives from their TV and film productions. However, that is definitely not the case. This point will focus much less on the adaptation itself, but on the series production, from camera work to design, dressing, effects, all that. First of all, cinematography. Regardless of the story, cast, source material, the cinematography of the Wheel of Time series is objectively bad. The field of view on the majority of the scenes is either too shallow when it needs to show grandiosity or too deep when it has to portray a character's reaction or conversation. I'll give two examples. The scene in both Tar Valen and Shadar Logov have no depth. In all the scenes, the actors will have a 5 meter, around 10 feet, hallway that they will walk through during a shot and there, there will be a cor corner or a building right in front uh, blocking the, the, the horizon. You cannot see a horizon through, through the streets, disrupting the feeling of a proper city. That issue is only enhanced with the poor camera movement. Uh, with upward panning that mimics early 90s low-budget shows. Another issue is also connected to the camera movement. The action shots of Magic with Moraine at one point and then uh, Loghain in the, in the first episode that he appears are again dated and close to comical, establishing a low to high wide angle focusing on the Magic user's hand. Next, the sets. To be direct, they look like sets. There's no depth, no movement, no fluidity, which gives a sense of a theme park or a multi-camera sitcom, rather than a fleshed out fantasy world. Another issue I have with the series is costume design. I am no expert in costume making or needlework, but all the costumes feel that they were either bought a target or a gap and that specially uh, Rand's outfit feels like he came out straight from a from a from a gap store or had no relation with how cultures developed and constructed their dressing they're not organic not based on any sort of established identity or nation and have no practicality for what they have been made this issue has nothing to do with the source material, but rather with creating a sense of connection between the people and their clothing. As an anthropologist, materials, clothing and tools are deeply connected to a people's identity. Where they come from and how the environment relates to their lives and costumes. Maybe Amazon and many, many other studios should start thinking of hiring more anthropologists as consultants. I won't touch on the subject of special effects and CGI problems, mostly because others much more experienced than I am on that sort of technology have already talked at length about it. But as an expectator, I should expect nothing less than cutting edge from Amazon. Again, arguably the biggest entertaining, uh, entertainment conglomerate in the world. The last issue I want to touch on is writing. Writing to discuss the mistakes and choices made through the jump from book to TV, sometime, something that was already debated by other people also, I want to look at the actual plot lines, character development and arcs of the series itself as an independent product. The main idea of the show was to make the five kids from Ammon's feud older. In and of itself, the decision to age a character for the benefit of the story is valid. Game of Thrones did that, 
and it worked for most part. However, the reason why those characters were aged was so can the writers could include uh, sex scenes and dial up the violence. Other than that, their whole character development, and then I'm talking about the Wheel of Time now, the whole character development was based on a coming of age story. Rents gullible, petty, and angsty. Egwene has a rebellious teen energy. Nynaeve is exactly the same, but angry and incomprehensively skeptic of Moraine in Lan for no apparent reason. Because the show does not show white people dislikes or even distrust Aes Sedai, and the opposite is actually uh, what, what we perceive. Perrin's there to add drama with his plot-turning wife, but uh, then falls on the YA love triangle plot. Those people should be, according to the series, in their mid-twenties. Nynaeve, close or in her early thirties. But other than having sex and having a wife, they act like children during the whole series. The plot lines, the important scenes, the whole arc of the show is based on a coming of age story for the five. But they need to be fully fledged adults from the start. That is a plot contrivance that shows that lack of care for the source material, but even a lack of care for their own product, for their own writing. Uh, their own writing is contradicting what they created for the show. They, they made them older, but the whole storyline, the whole plot lines that they go through the series is, is based on coming of age, YA, not YA, but uh, um, young people coming of age. Bringing a big name to a show like that sometimes can become a cursed chalice. Just like Matt's dagger can give him power, but also destroy him from within. Cursed Chalice of the Wheel of Time series is having such a major actor in their lineup, but the character played by this actor not being the center of the story in the source material. So you, as an Amazon Studio writer, to solve the dilemma have an idea. Why not make Moraine the main character of the show? That way you can have your cake and eat it too. Have a major name in your cast and move the plot to fit that reasoning. Again, as an independent choice, it is close to be reasonable. But the problem with having your cake and eating it is that you cannot do that. You cannot have Moraine as the center of the show, but having the plot of the show revolving around Rens, realizing that he is the Dragon Reborn. The issue is not having her as a principal character, but it's not making hers the main point of view. One idea to fix or make it work would be to have Moraine as the point of view of the show, changing the arcs and the plot of the whole series. Having her looking into the, 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 the five uh, kids from, from, from the two rivers, and uh, that way providing a different perspective from 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 the book series this is where the series becomes disconnected from the source materials in such a way that for all intents and purposes it should not be anymore called the wheel of time at this point the amazon creators should have perceived that they were deviating so much and so intensively from the story that they were either going to be seen as fan fiction or it was going to be a new IP altogether. I am still dealing with the show here as its own entity, but even doing that, the show itself falls into a trap of creating mystery when there is no mystery, subverting expectations that they themselves haven't developed properly to be subverted in the first place. They want people to see the show as its own thing, but want to keep the name recognition of the Wheel of Time. They want to subvert expectation from the book series, but want to be independent of it. They want to have their cake and eat it. 
the dragon reborn being a man, a channeler whose power comes from a cursed and tainted half of the one power, the reincarnation of Luz Terran. It's the hand that spins the wheel in the wheel of time. Taking that out, taking out the curse of Sidene, the split of the one power in two halves, the dragon prophecy, takes out of all the characters and plot lines involved in the show. Rand and Perrin have no say or do in the series. Nynaeve and Egwene, other than being aggressive and or suspicious, have no identity anymore. They don't leave Emlyn's view to save their friends or to see the word. They do it because there is a possibility that they too can be the Dragon Reborn. The show takes from one side, diminishing its weight, and gives to another, which now has so much in so little development that the person behind the character turns into an outlet without a life or a say, just moving with the flow of the plot. In the end, there is an undeniable gap created by Game of Thrones in the fantasy slash sci-fi TV today. In particular because of how Game of Thrones ended. The gap feels even deeper and darker than it would if it had been gracefully finished. However, as much as The Wheel of Time is one of the most well-known fantasy series of all time, that does not make it automatically ready and set to be turned into a show. Even less one to hit the same spots that Game of Thrones did. A Song of Ice and Fire, from its inception, was written as an adult fantasy series. It was Martin's wish to grab what Tolkien had created and twist it, including politics, sexuality, language, etc. His idea of a story was to create a raw, hard feel of the fantastic. Robert Jordan was quite the opposite. His Wheel of Time, even though less erudite than Tolkien, was much closer to a high fantasy, full of magic curses, wizards, orcs, slash trollocs, that Martin's bloody, gore, explicit writing. Beside that, there is an urge for Amazon to have things happen overnight. Rush Productions can absolutely break a show. I, and many others, understand that there were difficulties of having to reschedule the show due to the global pandemic and write things around an actor leaving mid-production. But the need to have something released as soon as possible, as if in a factory line, can most of the times hurt the production rather than improve it. Warrior of the Altai was written in 13 days but it took decades to be actually alive and breathing. The Wheel of Time cannot be the next Game of Thrones, but Amazon saw the opportunity to skip any writing and creation of an original series and aimed for the two biggest names available, and focused its efforts not in adapting beloved series but to create the next Game of Thrones. The Wheel of Time have suffered from it, from inclusion of plot lines that break even the internal logic of the show's writing, the show's itself writing, in detriment of building a love letter to an existing IP. I don't believe I can write a screenplay for a series as big as The Wheel of Time, but I have put some thought into what I imagine would be somehow a good idea for anyone trying to produce a uh, a series based on the Wheel of Time, based on the lore of the Wheel of Time, uh, but with the opportunity to develop something original. Raisers of the series will know that the word presented in the Wheel of Time book series is a possible future of our own world. And for every spinning of the wheel, an age ends and another begins. Therefore, why not build a series around the word after the happenings of the book series. It could be one of or several spins of the wheel with some characters and some plots reincarnated, but basically it would be a blank, fresh canvas for writers to be creative. But at the same time, honoring the well-crafted lore developed by Robert Jordan. I want to thank you very much for watching this. I 
really enjoy making this video and I hope we can have some productive discussions in the comments so please follow me follow me on my socials if you want to know more about uh, writing lessons editing lessons uh, courses that I do uh, and even read my my writings all the links are in the description and you can follow me on all my socials so thank you very much and see you later